All right, well, we are going to get started. My name is Shannon Netswicki, and I am the Assistant Director of Internships and Employment Development at Un University of Toledo's Career Services. Welcome. This is our inaugural senior day, popping off the program with uh, negotiate, negotiating and accepting job offers. We're really excited to have um, some new and returning employer partners to the table. I'm really grateful that um, all of our employers today took time out of their days to come and talk to students about all of these hot topics that are going through a lot of our minds right now as we tr transition from college to career. So I'm going to take a, a moment for um, any employer partners are online. I'm presenting right now, so I can't see who's all online, but just to kind of introduce themselves and, and talk a little bit about what you do. So you may want to un unmute yourself when you're ready to speak. Okay, thanks. Hi, sorry. I had my AirPods in. Um, so my name is Hillary Kessler. I work in human resources at Nishmai Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Um, we are kind of learning this new normal with the pandemic along with all of you. So I'm excited to connect and hope that I can, you know, offer some advice and maybe find a way to get you down to Columbus to start your first post-grad role um, as a, I guess, like, an, as a grown-up, truly adulting. <laughs> Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, this is Dawn Humphrey with Fifth Third Bank Talent Acquisition. Um, I do the recruiting for our retail banking centers on our sales platform side. Um, for the Northwestern Ohio market, as well as Nashville and Atlanta area. So glad to be here um, to speak with you all. Great, welcome Don. I'm not sure if Target's on the line yet. Well, I guess we can get started. Um, really today, you know, we don't have necessarily a presentation. We're just kind of asking questions and doing some roundtable discussions and um, definitely have the opportunity for students to ask questions. Um, and the employers, we really wanted to kind of hear from you to get some of the best practices that are happening um, around, around these topics. So the first question we kind of had is just to get it going is um, negotiating. I, I would just have to say this and negotiating is a question that comes up a lot in um, our work, especially this time of year, because, you know, we talk about resumes and cover letters. And then there's also the kind of this awkward topic about accepting job offers and which I look for in benefits and, and how do I negotiate my salary? And it's been a topic um, also in our association for internships and employers as well, too. But when is it appropriate to discuss salary? If you have any insight on that, that would be um, great. Um, so I give a little bit of background. So we um, are at Nishmai Children's Hospital. We are a nonprofit. So I like to say that, you know, we are competitive in salary, but for a lot of the positions that new grads would be looking at, it's pretty, um, straightforward. So I think it's appropriate to discuss salary with the recruiter. Um, we have had some instances where candidates will ask those questions to the hiring manager. And really, that's something that lives within our talent acquisition realm. Um, a lot of times the managers may not know the background behind it. Um, and then it can also be a huge turnoff. So and it's kind of tough because I know it's hard when you're getting ready to finish school and not really sure you know, what these positions might pay or where it could fall. And you're really just trying to figure out how you can pay your student loans and live on your own and do all these things. So I think, you know, one benefit of having these types of things, and I can share my contact info. If you do see a role you're interested in at Nationwide Children's Hospital, we can have a conversation offline because, you know, depending on the area, there might be some wiggle room. But for the kind of base of this whole thing, I think 
to talk with your recruiter. Um, yeah. And then typically, you know, that could either be at the initial part of the conversation, like after they've learned a little bit about you, just to make sure you're not, you know, wasting, um, we're not wasting your time and you're making the most of your efforts, or it could be towards the end once you get to the offer. It really just kind of depends, which is probably not the answer you wanted to hear. Um, but a lot of it depends on the job, the area, you know, the manager, what's going on in the organization at the time. Hi, this is Dawn. So I echo um, almost exactly what Hillary said. Um, I have that conversation initially on with my um, phone screens at the beginning of the process, just so that we can have that conversation and we know where each other stands, like if this is going to be a fit or not. And like Hillary said, you're not, we're not wasting your time and we just have that um, clear conversation. So, because again, that's not a conversation for the hiring manager and we actually ask our hiring managers to stay away from that, let us deal with that. So um, yes, the initial conversation I feel is the best time to discuss that but you know, different organizations handle it um, in varying ways. Thank you. Great, do we have any questions from the chat yet, Devlin? Well, the chat is clear. Just feel free, any of the students and anyone who want to ha may wanna ask a question, if you could put it in chat, I'll make sure that I read it out for the presenters. Also, we have a link for uh, check-in attendance. If you'll select there before you leave at some point to record your attendance, that would be great. Thank you so much. I just got a notification that Target is here too. Uh, if anybody from Target is on the line, would you mind introducing yourself and kind of just uh, talking about your role? I see Keon's here now. Okay, maybe he's having some difficulties. Okay, we can move on to the next question. Um, what kind of research should candidates do to help them negotiate an offer? And this is one of the topics that we do try to talk to students about is doing their research before going in and talking about salary and negotiating offers. So any advice you can give us on what kind of research you think they should do would be great. in on this one first and Don maybe you and I can just go back and forth until Target joins us. Um, so good. I think it's really important to research obviously the organization. We have those tools like Glassdoor and Indeed um, but a lot of time for most part those are self-reported and it's tough when you're looking at the experience that you have comparing it to somebody who may have self-reported that so I think when you're, you know, considering an offer, it should be big picture. So it's not just based on that salary. Right now, um, you know, things are pretty out of whack with the pandemic. So things I would want to know is what's PTO? Um, what does that look like? That is something I would always encourage you to negotiate, whether it's asking, you know, if you have planned trips ahead of time. So PTO is a big one. I would also understand what the retirement looks like. So at Nation My Children's, um, we still offer a pension. So after five years, you're fully vested. And although as a new grad, that might not seem like a big deal, it actually is. So if you're 21, you know, between 20 and 22, to think five years when you're getting into your mid to late 20s, if you left that organization and went somewhere else, you would still be receiving money after you retire at 60 or 65, whatever your um, you know, thing is. Um, I would also ask about flexibility within your schedule. So some organizations, you know, in some roles, like if you're a clinical role, we can't really be flexible with that. Like you need to be on the unit for that set shift. But other roles you can ask, you know, is there remote opportunities? Am I able to flex time? So if I over one day and I, you know, take time off the next day. Those are all things that I think are important outside of just the salary. And a lot of times, you know, students or new grads aren't aware that that's really considered part of the offer too. Yeah, and that's a really good point, Hillary. That's what we try to um, 
talk to students about too. It's not only about the numbers they see when it comes to the salary. There's a lot that goes on to it. health insurance and, and, and researching um, your paid time off or if they offer tuition remission. That was a, you know, a big thing for me too as well. So all of those things kind of play into your salary. Um, and it's sometimes difficult to get that full picture when you're going right into your first entry level job. Mm -hmm. And it's tough because I mean, I was there, I, I know it, that right after school, you're like, how am I gonna pay my student loans? I don't wanna move back in with my parents. I wanna have a working car and not have to worry about it. So all of those things are super important. That's obviously at the front of your mind, but then really there are much bigger pieces. And obviously I'm sure you've heard this many times, but don't just chase the money. Um, it's gonna really hurt in the long run or you're gonna find yourself in a position where you're really uncomfortable and you're not able to leave because of that financial piece. So I think, you know, prior to the offer, really making sure that that company aligns with, you know, what you're looking for, what your values are, you know, what kind of job, the growth opportunities, all of those things are so important, just, you know, outside of what your paycheck might look like coming in every week or every other week or however often you might get paid. Thank you. Shannon, I have one question from the audience. So from uh, Juwan actually asked, is there a specific way students should approach the question about salary, i.e. how should they approach the topic without it being a turnoff? John, I can, if you wanna take this one and I can jump in if it's different. I feel like we're kind of the same on a lot of our pieces. Hello. I don't understand what I can hear. Keon, I think you're. We can hear you. Huh? We can hear you. Oh wow! Hi, I'm sorry. We I've been saying that for a few minutes now. Huh. Hello. Uh, what is Keon? Oh, I'm, I'm one of the executive team leaders with Target, and um, I'll just hop right in on what you guys are talking about, um, and I can do an introduction later, but. I do agree. I think um, for the students on the call, um, I think it was Dawn, she was talking through um, the fact that uh, it's not all, always about the money. I think for me, I graduated college 2017 and I've, I've been in my career for the last two or three years. And I think what I figured out very quickly is, you know, you're, you're going to be working a long time and you know, you're going to make uh, hopefully a lot of money in that time. But uh, the amount of happiness and the amount of enjoyment you get out of your job and the amount of growth you find in that job in the first couple of years has been like really important for me. Um, I started doing a lot of work with Shannon and Davlin uh, last year uh, with the University of Toledo. For me, it, it sparked a whole new interest in my job for me and completely like, I, I'm not even focused on the money anymore. And I would say when I first started, it was definitely that. And now I'm more focused on what I can do different and what I can do to grow myself at the company. Yeah, those, those are really good points, especially for students coming out of um, just coming out of college and they're in their first entry level job. And I do I do try to be um, honest with students when they ask me these types of questions. Like a lot of times, especially even when I was coming out of college, you're, there's not a lot of room for negotiation until you can kind of get some of that experience. But um, I do agree that there's a much larger picture to your career. And And another thing I tell students, too, is you know, on average, this generation will not necessarily change jobs, but change careers up to five different times. So just be flexible and, and you know, just look at those other opportunities and think of every opportunity as a pathway to, to um, what your ultimate goals are too. I think there's a, one of the sessions for asking, you know, interviews and asking questions, but I think it's fair to ask, you know, what other, like, what career paths could come from this role? What have other new grads experienced? Um, a lot of times, like when I do my, you know, university and college info sessions, I have specific examples of people who entered, you know, the organization as a new grad and really wanted this end career in mind and how they were able to navigate it. So depending on the organization, there's a lot of pieces that just take some digging, um, but that's really where building that you know, relationship with that town acquisition partner or recruiter comes in handy because you want them to know what you're really looking for big picture. And honestly, that's one of the favorite parts of my job is I really feel like I'm a matchmaker. So if I think that, wow, they're 
you know, they're qualified and they would be a great fit in this role, but the things that I'm hearing, I think they might be better fit for something else. Then I'm really able to partner with you and, you know, help you get there. And then, you know, from personal experience, I know it's hard. I know it's really not fun to do, but just being able to grow your network and talk with different people will be so helpful later on. And, you know, you'll get maybe even a step up of others just because you might have this information on what the offer future might look like. So you can start planning ahead with that. One thing that I heard at a conference that I was, and we can move on to the next questions too, but um, uh, I was at a conference in fall um, and they were talking about, it was a conference with career services professionals, but also employers as well too, kind of bringing them together. And um, they were talking, some of the employers were talking about how their, the, the students or candidates that were coming out of college had a really high expectation of what the salaries were. So they were, <laughs> I don't know if you all are experiencing that, but they were asking for salaries that were way out of what they, the job posting had and what their could offer. So do you have any advice for that? You know, just kind of thinking about what the offer should be. Hey, Shannon, um, this is Keon again with Target. Um, so being that, like I said, I just graduated college myself in 2017, and um, I would definitely say what you just said is very true. Um, I think as a recent college grad, you do, and just in my experience, I think a lot of my peers said the same thing. We did kind of have a, a higher number in our head coming out of college than in my experience was offered. You know, I think I had like three or four different offers from pretty good companies coming out of college and all of them were less than what I thought I would have been making coming out of college. And um, I think you made a really good point. You know, I think that a lot of times students do come to companies and I've even seen it with us trying to hire people. You know, we bring them in, uh, you know, people have a very high number that they believe they're worth and a lot of people are not, you know, willing to change that. For the other professionals, have you guys, usually when you guys have, an, have you guys seen the same thing for your company? So I can kind of give like a personal story too with this. Um, so I did my internship here at Beach My Children's and during that time I was working with a recruiter and I was told that I would come out making between fifty five and sixty five thousand dollars and I was like, oh, that's going to be so great. I'm going to be able to do all this stuff. And then in my initial conversation in my internship, like I wasn't even, I hadn't graduated yet. Um, the recruiter told me that I was going to make fourteen dollars an hour. And I went home and I cried like the whole night because I was like, I'm never going to be able to move out of my parents' house once I come back. Like I had a total meltdown. And then really I, so I finished, you know, my program and I actually accepted my first job here before I graduated. And the opportunities that I've had and I've seen others similar to me, it would have never happened if I wouldn't have come here just based on what I was told. So it's tough because I was told, you know, you're going to make this much money. And then at the same time, I have my parents, you're worth more than $14 an hour. You and I, they were totally right. But overall, the experience that I've had here, like, and, you know, if you want to know kind of more about like what we do and, you know, my career path and all of that, and I have some others I can talk about, like, please reach out to me, we can talk offline. But the stuff that I've been able to do um, and just learn and grow, make, starting off at $14 an hour is probably triple what my friends who graduated at the same time who accepted jobs making much more than me were have even accomplished within the first like five years of their career. So it's tough because I know that you hear this and you're told this for so long and Maybe you even go into that program because you think you're going to come out and make us all this money right off the bat. And I get it. Like, I lived it. I am living it. I, I understand. But it does get better. And just know that, you know, it's not always realistic. But, again, building the relationships with, you know, talent acquisition partners and different recruiters will really help you navigate those pieces that can be really tough initially. And maybe have some of those hard conversations and, give you a little bit of time to digest it before, you know, going into total panic mode, thinking there's no way I'm going to ever be able to, because it's completely possible. You just have to get a little bit creative with it. Yes, thank you for that. 
Let's see what other questions we have in here. How can candidates na navigate salary conversations and respectful counter offer? So I know we've talked a little bit about um, what what can be done and what should be done, but let's just say a student did want to talk about have a conversation about salaries. How, what is the best approach for that? And and thing as well. Shannon, um, and I use my personal experience. Um, so um, around the time when I you know was joining uh, Target. I went through some similar uh, salary conversation. I think I was very nervous to have the conversation. I was very nervous to like ask about the salary. I was nervous to ask if I could possibly make more than what the salary was. And I think the biggest thing for me was uh, the confidence piece. And you know, I had a conversation with my mentor at the time, and he, you know, we, he asked me why did I feel like I deserved more, what number I felt, and why did I feel that way. And I think for me, when I was talking to the recruiter, I had a lot of confidence in why I felt like I deserved uh, the, the amount I was asking for. And I think. For students, that's what I would say. I think if you are, would like to counter offer or you would like to inquire, I think having confidence and, and even writing it out maybe beforehand would just help you. That way you can have a guided conversation rather than just kind of diving in and not really knowing where you want to, what you want to talk about, I would say. I'll add to that. I think being confident is a big thing, but also I think it is very advantageous to be humble. So, being able to say, you know, I really want to work for you and I'm so excited about this career opportunity, but when I look at what my student loan payment is going to be, what rent might look like, what my car situation is, really I have to get to this number. And coming, you know, everyone's been there, they get it. So just being totally honest with those types of things and, you know, I think a lot of time it helps because it makes you not seem overconfident and still know that you are a new grad and you might need to be, you know, get more experience to get to that point. But then it really just can put people on the same page where there are added things that could play in. So maybe there's a sign on bonus. Maybe there is relocation um, expense covered. Like there's a lot of other things that can open up by just saying, you know, hey, here's where I'm at and this is why. And I mean, we've seen that before. I think you just made some really good points as well. Like another thing is just thinking outside the box. You know, a lot of times certain companies might have like a cap or a threshold where they're not able to increase by a certain amount. But what you just said in regards to relocation, in regards to other benefits, PTO, I mean, their companies have a lot of different ways that they can compensate. And I think if you can, you know, talk through other ways of being compensated, you know, they might be able to help you out in another way. And I know with our offers, this is Dawn Fifth Third. Um, you know, there's the base pay, but then based on your performance, you're eligible for a compensation or bonus. So um, one person or two different individuals can have comparable base, but that person that is exceeding and meeting their goals, meeting or exceeding their goals, their total package as far as their um, total compensation and pay is going to be more at the end of the day because of their performance. So I think uh, counter offer, think of what what your reason is for that counter and have um, that so that that discussion is very um, fluid between you and the recruiter. I think Don made a really good point. Like if I know all of these pieces up front, I'm going to go to bat for you. Like. I want to be able to get people as much money as I can help get them. So I may not share all of those, you know, the details of the conversation that we had together, but it just better prepares me to go to the rec or go to that hiring manager or go to, you know, our compensation department and say, hey, I need more. We can't lose this candidate. What else can I do to help make up, you know, the gap of what they're looking for? Or do we have other, you know, Things. Like we have, um, we get a discount with Verizon. So there's a lot of times where you might not think about that. So then we talk about your phone bill and you could save this much money. Is that going to make up for it? Or if you're looking, you know, comparing us to another organization, you only have to pay maybe $5 for parking downtown where other, you know, companies, they might offer you a lot more money, but you might be paying 200 bucks a month to park. So, 
of those pieces that it's hard to think about, but again, that, you know, let the recruiter kind of be your champion. That's what we love doing. I think that's why we get into these roles because we want to be able to, you know, make a positive impact and change somebody's life. And those are things that help me kind of build that case for you. I have one more question if we're finished with that from the chat from Xavier Johnson. It says, are there any benefits being full-time on salary versus full-time paid hourly? Think uh, um, so. I, I'll go just because, like, I work retail, um, and I don't know if it's the same for the other people on the call, but um, there is a big difference. Um, and I think that question goes like a little deeper. I think the one thing I would recommend to anybody is just truly, truly understand the nature of the business you're getting into before um, you get into it. Because, like, retail, I think in my mind, I just didn't think through what Christmas and things like that would look like and what the hours would look like then, as opposed to what it might look like during the summertime. And vice versa, you take right now during a pandemic, um, you know, we're working a lot to make sure, you know, we're taking care of the general public to make sure, you know, we are an essential business, so doing our part to take care of our community. But, you know, along with that, there are a lot of hours. And, um, you know, when you are salary, you are not necessarily compensated for those hours. So I would say um, it's all about you. You know, if you're somebody who's going to go to work and you want to just continue to drive and see things get better, you know, you can spend all your hours there, that's great. If you are someone who's there, you know, in particular for the money, I think being hourly and working a lot of hours would be a lot more suitable. I think it really depends on the organization um, and how they build things. So I think for me, when I went from out for um, non-exempt, which is hourly to exempt, I was like super excited and I thought, man, I've really hit the big time, but kind of like, um, Karen was saying, I then was working much more than 40 hours, and I was like, oh, I would kill to be getting overtime right now. So those are things to kind of ask up front. Um, but then, so with us, we could offer you exempt, which means you're salaried, or non-exempt, which means you're hourly. But our offers come based on an hourly rate. So if you are going to make $16 an hour, you're going to make $16 an hour, whether you're hourly or a salaried um, employee. And then I always tell people if you're going to work full time. So for our hourly people, we base it on a 40 hour work week that's considered full time. But then for our exempt people, our COO has basically said it's between 45 and 50 hours a week. But regardless of what those are, I always multiply by 2080. So 28. And then that'll give you, if you're taking an hourly job and working full time, which, you know, if 40 hours is full time, what your total salary might look like. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think some other people do it that way, but most of the time it's like pretty upfront. But to us, it's kind of the same thing as with Target. Like if you're going to work more and, and you're going to be salaried, then you might not see that overtime come through. Um, but I also think there can be more flexibility when you're a salaried employee too. So there is flex time. If you have a doctor's appointment, maybe you don't have to take PTO for that to make up for those hours you missed, or you know, there's pluses and minuses with both of them, but those are all good questions to ask up front. So you kind of know what you're getting yourself into um, before you accept an offer. This is Dawn, I would echo both um, Kevin and Hillary. So I was going to ask to kind of just a follow up to that. Um, some students don't have all this information. I know it's really important for students to kind of look at the full picture and know. What do you suggest students do besides reaching out to their career services, of course, um, but during the interview process to kind of just say like, hey, I need I need to ask some questions about the salary or what does this mean as a full picture? Do you think that that's more appropriate for like during the interview after the interview? Not sure what happened here, but um, so just kind of talking about like when when because we do encourage students to ask questions. So when when is appropriate for them to kind of ask these types of questions about about their benefits and salaries and all that? Uh, I think it's appropriate at with the the initial conversation with the initial conversation um, because as Hillary mentioned. Um, 
you know, you know, I feel we feel that we're the um, candidates champion. I mean, so we can give the big picture benefits, um, what we're looking for in a candidate um, compensation. So I think all that is either the initial conversation or you can follow up if you forgot to. I think again, same as like Don was saying, but goes back to the networking and building that relationship with that recruiter. So I think partnering with career services and, you know, attending info sessions or reaching out, to connect with people on LinkedIn, those conversations can be tough to have. And, you know, you might be wondering, I don't know how this is going to be received or is this the right thing to say? And the better relationship that you have, the easier those will come. Um, and then even, you know, if you're applying to a job that's not one I'm currently recruiting for, you know, we can have those conversations. So working with career services to establish, you know, who that main point of contact is within that, you know, employer, their town acquisition or human resources office. And then, you know, hopefully you can get some of those answers ahead of time. Um, for us, I don't know, I kind of go both ways. Like I want to be totally honest, but I think delivery and tone is also super important because if you ask me right off the bat, but just if your tone is, I don't know, then in my mind, I'm kind of like, man, it doesn't really seem like they're that focused on, you know, what the hospital stands for. So my job as a recruiter, town acquisition partner is I'm screening for, you know, do you meet the qualifications? Are you a culture fit? Do your vision and what you're looking for what you do as an organization? Um, so sometimes if, you know, you hit me with one of those questions right off the bat before I've even really got to learn about you, it kind of throws me off because I want to make sure that you're a good fit for us and we're a good fit for you before we even really start talking about all of those extra pieces. But that's just me. I mean, I, I could be the weird one. Um. No, I, I think um, I think it's the same thing as like if you were you know to spin it from different sides. I'm not I'm not a recruiter, but even when you know you have people who are you know looking to join, or even when they're going through and doing and networking and talking to peers or in other companies, I think that's really important. You know, it's all about like tone and even taking an opportunity to look at what the company stands for. Because when people come up to you, the only thing they're talking about is money. As someone who works for the company, you know, I, I like getting paid as well. But you know, when I think through why I work for Target, it's a lot more than just that. And like. If I want to bring somebody in or if I want to help somebody do that, I would definitely want it to be somebody who's going to uh, hopefully help the company more than, you know, just want to, you know, like hypothetically just collect money. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I think, like you said, it's all about tone and delivery when you're talking to people like recruiters or even people who are going to help you get into a company. Yes, those are some great points. Devin, do we have any questions from the chat box? All right, let's move on to see if we have any other questions here. Oops. This is a good one. We do get this one a lot, but what are some questions candidates should ask before accepting a job offer? I think it's important to ask pretty much everything we've been talking about. If you haven't already asked at that point, um, I would ask what the expected start date is. I think that's important. I would also ask about um, what pre-employment might, might look like, um, just so you have a better understanding of that process and really what the time frame is. So if you have another company you're interviewing with and you're really interested in both of them, if one gets kind of over before the other one and they're pretty even, right? So you like them both, they align with what you're really looking for. I would ask if you can have some time to think about that offer. And, but again, be transparent with that recruiter, talent acquisition partner. Like I have a, you know, I'm interviewing somewhere else. I really want to consider both. Um, but just asking all of those extra pieces, like is there relocation or are there any other benefits that we might not have talked about that could be helpful? Um, those are all things just to help you get the better picture. Cause again, I, you know, I really take pride in making sure it's a good fit for both people. Um, you know, the company and that manager and their team and then you. So I think as much information as you can get, but also understand that as a recruiter, I might not have all of those answers because I don't work in that job or that department. So 
I can also help facilitate some of that conversation with the hiring manager to make it a little less stressful for you um, and get some of those answers so that you know you're not asking and wondering and then because that really stinks if you accept an offer and then you don't start for you know another month or six weeks and you're like, I have all these questions I should have asked you know it's a good opportunity to get everything covered kind of in one sitting and then if not we can kind of keep going back and forth on it yeah I would agree and I think another good question is to ask what does the training look like so you know training can be four weeks six weeks six months um so that should be a question and then i know some employers uh, not here at fifth third there's a probationary period i think some employers still have that but um that may be a question that um would be good to ask before accepting Yes, those are all good questions that we try to have have students ask and sometimes they just don't necessarily understand. Um, I, I had just personal experience working in career services. I had a student that what at, during their offer, they weren't talking about benefits at all. So they didn't know what the benefits were. So I always encourage students to, to ask about that if it doesn't come up in your job offer. And then one of my questions to you all is if students and you talked about, you know, taking a couple minutes or taking some time to think about the offer, how much is too much time or how much little time? Because um, I do advise students to offer a little bit. I think talking, I mean, thinking about the offer is great. So technically in our offer letter, the candidate has 10 days to respond. Now the hiring manager would definitely like an answer before that. So sometimes I was like, they actually have 10 days. So, you know, it's just 24 hours, give them time. But, um, you know, they actually hear that we have, um, you know, they have 10 days to accept or decline the offer. Um, usually they're accepting right away. So I very rarely have I seen someone wait 10 days unless they have something, um, they're making a decision between a, a couple different companies then I may find that out. But um, I want it is to take this time to think about the offer, the whole package before they decide to move forward just to make sure that it's best for them. I think um, I agree with Don. So we don't really have like a set timeline here of how much time we could give you. Um, obviously the sooner the better. But again, I think it's saying like, okay, I'm really excited. Um, I wanna talk over with my parents or you know, my partner just to make sure that this is the right fit. Um, for me, if I would offer, depending on the level of the role. So if I would offer a job on Thursday, I would probably, if you, and you wanted to think of it, give you till Monday or Tuesday. Um, but I think this is kind of where the candidate, candidate can hold some of the power too by saying, okay, great. I'm really excited. I want to check, you know, look things over, really read through your benefits package, see if I have any questions. Can I let you know by X? So by you saying what date works best for you, then you're kind of setting that. And I mean, I can always come back and say, you know, unfortunately, I really need to know within this amount of time, but it kind of, you know, gives you the power to make time that's make sure that it's, you know, enough time for you to be comfortable with what you're doing. This is really like life changing. Um, hopefully, you know, this isn't just a job that you're going to take until something better comes along. We really want to, you know, depending on wherever you work, you know, I would hope that you're finding a role that you can start your career and it's not just a filler job that you're going to gain all of these big things. And who knows, you know, you could go one way or the other. So it's something that is important and you should really take some time to think about, but also like the sooner you tell me, the more excited I'm going to be. So but set that timeline for yourself and then work with your recruiter on, you know, what works best for you and the organization and what the, you know, the current needs are. Yeah, that's some great, great advice um, about asking questions. And I think some students may be apprehensive a little bit just because they don't want the offer to go away or they just don't know what they, you know, they should be doing navigating this, this um, larger world just coming from college to career. So um, thank you for that. Shannon and Mike. One last. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to 
I'm just going to say was, <laughs> I was sorry, I just said that you're making some really good points, and I was going to say, like, as a recent grad, I would just tell all the students, like, ask too many questions. I think recruiters, uh, people in human resources, a lot of these uh, people that are hiring, um, they, they truly have the information that you want to find out anyway, and a lot of times they're, they're waiting on you to already ask the question. You know, they probably already had it prepped. They probably have the information in front of them. It's just, you, you know, a lot of this information isn't just going to get volunteered, and that's something I've learned in the first few years of working here is you can ask for more money. I mean, it's, you can ask for almost anything. You just have to ask and have to, like, be willing to be open and be vulnerable with the recruiter or with whoever you're talking to. Just one piece of advice, the worst thing, which is probably really annoying as like a new grad and a candidate is accepting a job and then having to listen to your parents or your grandparents or somebody else ask all of these questions and then being like, oh, I don't know. That's a good, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. And then you would have to go back and forth. So it's just kind of like putting trust to your plate too, because you know, they're not going to drop it till you tell them what they want to hear. So by having those things up front, it better prepare you to then share how excited you are about you know this new journey that you're going on with your friends and family um but then you know you're not just kind of waiting because if it is something that's a good point like my gosh i didn't ask about paid time off and i have this trip coming up oh no what am i going to do and you know you come up with that question on a friday afternoon heaven forbid it could be a holiday weekend you might have to wait four days to even hear back so just as much as you can get ahead of time saves you from some of those maybe annoying conversations with people who really care about you afterwards. Right. One of the questions that we get a lot, and I kind of talked about the last one is, you know, if we negotiate or try to ask for like a higher offer or a different offer, um, I think the fear is that the offer will go away, kind of like, oh, you know, now we are not going to be hiring you. Can you talk or just hit on that a little bit? Because we do get that a lot. And I just think it's just as Kian was talking about the confidence and, and going into it. But um, what that looks like from your side when when uh, students or candidates go and ask for different offers. So, go Hillary. Oh, I was just going to say I would ask it to the recruiter, um, but then I would follow up in an email. So, hi, I really appreciated that time. Here are, you know, I'm excited about this offer, but here's what I'm countering with. And then the same with from the recruiter, if you are asking for time to, you know, think about it. Um, so I know Don had said earlier that they have offer letters. So our offer letters at HMI Children's actually don't go out until you've accepted and we have scheduled pre-employment and, you know, identified a start date. So I think, you know, the candidate, you would just feel better if you had that in writing to go back and refer to, but then kind of on our end, like once it's in writing, unless I would respond back and say, no, actually we talked about this. It's a good just piece for you to keep too, for like to make sure that, you know, you're not nervous about it. Um, but then also, you know, once we have it in writing, if there's a set timeline on there, then we can't really, you know, rescind the, we can rescind the offer, but there would be a lot of things that would have to come in place for that to happen. Yeah, so, sorry, I kind of forgot the question, but um, the offer, the offer doesn't go away. So if you counter, either we're going to say, sorry, we're unable to meet your counter offer. Um, you know, the initial offer still stands, um, but, you know, it won't go away. But I do get that uh, either in also internal employees think like, is it going to go away? No, you know, ask the question and I'll say yes or no, or meet you somewhere in the middle. So again, it's all about that communication and being transparent. Thank you for that. We we try to talk to students about that, um, but again, it's it's really helpful to hear it from the employers because we do we do encourage them to ask questions. And again, like you guys were saying, this is their livelihood. This is their big step, and and you want to have all the information that you need to be successful. And and on your end too, you want that for your candidates and new hires as well. So thank you for that. Do we have any other questions? I can't see the chat, Davlin, but not sure if any questions came through. We don't. 
don't have any more in the chat at the moment. Okay. Um, so we have another session coming up here at one o'clock. I believe it's interviewing. So it would be nice to take a break because I know some of our employers are on here more than more than once. So they can take a little break. But um, one of my biggest things is employers who are on the call today and the students go on LinkedIn and we are doing a session later on LinkedIn, but connect with them right away and start asking questions and just trying to build that network, especially during the times that we are, we are in right now. It's really important that students are virtually networking as much as possible. So we're trying to really encourage that. So go on LinkedIn and try to connect with some of our employers as well. Thank you all for joining this session. Um, and we will be going oh, so to the session soon. I just wanted to add, this is Laura Jane here. Um, Shannon, if you could click to the next slide, we also have our first destination for the students that are on um, the call right now. If you haven't taken your first destination survey, this is a great way to share um, all the great things that you're doing. Um, we wanna hear what you're doing after graduation. So if you can um, fill out that survey, that would be amazing. Um, we appreciate it. And we're looking forward to seeing what you're all doing. So thank you. Yes, thank you. We will see you all at one o'clock for, for virtual interviewing. Thank you for all of your feedback. This has been awesome. Thank you. Hey, thanks for having us. Thanks. Any students, that, before you leave, could you please check the uh, attendance link in the chat for us so we can keep uh, a, a count of who attended the meeting today? Thank you. Evelyn, I don't see the chat, the um, link in the chat right now. I don't know if it accidentally got sent to a different area or not. No one for me, but I'll paste it again. Awesome. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.